So uh, moving on, uh, we are also privileged uh, to have our next speaker, who is currently the executive director of the Oscar M. Lopez Center, Philippines, while simul simultaneously serving as the country coordinator and a senior natural resource management scientist of ECRAFT or the World Agroforestry Center. He is also an affiliate professor of the University of, of the Philippines, Los Banos. At the same time, an academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology, Philippines. He has spent two decades of his professional in engagement serving as lead author or coordinating lead author in various IPCC report starting on the third and then fourth, fifth, and even currently as a coordinating lead author on the ongoing sixth assessment report. Our speaker is also a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts of the Philippine Climate Change Commission to discuss with us the topic on climate change research and communication in the Philippines. It is my pleasure to call on Dr. Rodel D. Lasco. Rodel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John, for that uh, generous introduction. And if I can share my screen now, uh, and uh, talk about the topic uh, that was uh, assigned to me, and that is uh, the topic on research, uh, communication. And I'd like to tell you the story of what we did at the Oscar M. Lopez Center. Uh, it's an NGO, a civil society organization, and uh, funded by the Lopez Group of Companies. And I'd like to tell you the stories uh, that we have been uh, working on uh, for the past uh, eight years. The whole center started because of the vision of uh, one person. Uh, this person is, of course, Oscar M. Lopez, uh, and he is the chair emeritus of the center, uh, still quite active in his late 80s. And he started the center because of his concern that climate and climate change is harming the Filipino people, and he wanted to help. And he thought the best way to do it is to establish a science-based center that will work on climate adaptation here in, in the Philippines. And uh, the key guiding principle of the center is that uh, all climate action should be guided by the latest science. So it's a unique uh, NGO. It's a unique organization in our country. It's uh, privately funded an NGO but very much into science. It is almost like uh, a science center in any of our universities uh, here in the Philippines. And so, yeah, again, just to tell you some of the stories that we have been that, uh, sort of cooking uh, in the center, uh, here's one. Well, what we uh, tried to do here was to provide advisories. In fact, we do provide regular advisories to the members of the, the group of companies, but at the same time, we try to uh, analyze uh, and uh, just to see what are the impacts of the first typhoon in the Philippines, that's Typhoon Ambo is the local name. And if we overlay lay that to the current uh, incidence of pandemic, COVID-19 in the Philippines. So again, here, the sort of the assumption or the hypothesis is that these global challenges, whether pandemics, uh, climate change, biodiversity conservation, all of these planetary scale challenges need to be analyzed in an interconnected fashion. We need to look at it from a systems perspective. And so we plotted the course of the typhoon. And uh, so this was before the typhoon hit so that we will have advanced information on which local communities will be hit and what is the state of the spread of the pandemic in that particular community. So here we see that we can overlay the analysis of uh, a climate hazard like a tropical cyclone or a typhoon and overlay that with the uh, incidence of uh, pandemics. And again, this is uh, with the idea that we should do more and more of this analysis combining, co combining 
the analysis of different global challenges so that we can respond in a more holistic and systematic way. And so looking at this study, uh, again, uh, climate hazards uh, will continue to complicate COVID-19 response and recovery. By the way, we did a, a series of those overlays. So before the typhoon, uh, after the typhoon, and even longer term, what are the lessons we can learn? And here are some of the lessons. So uh, the continued complication of COVID-19 response given climate hazards like typhoons. And uh, again, the behavioral changes uh, needed to respond to climate change in the long run. And, uh, but the challenge is how to sustain those changes, even if we change our lifestyle right now, and some of those changes could be uh, beneficial to climate adaptation, for example, and climate mitigation. But how do we sustain them in the long run? And then third, as the lockdown restrictions are eased, and in fact, it's happening right now, it is also an opportunity for us to transition to a more sustainable and resilient uh, society. And again, as mentioned, addressing multiple simultaneous threats, uh, the need for holistic, more systematic approaches so that we can build long-term our resilience. And then also the center is uh, working with our uh, climate uh, institutions in this country and producing uh, several uh, products. Uh, so on the left side, you see there our Philippines version of the IPCC report. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Polhin, Professor uh, Cruz, both of them are very much involved in uh, leading this work. And then uh, also we are producing state of the Philippine climate with our MET office. Uh, the Philippine assessment reports are produced with the Climate Change Commission and uh, again, uh, we also produce an almanac. So there are many products, uh, several knowledge products, and all of these are available freely from our website. Anyone can download this. We don't sell our products. Now, the other thing that we recently did, uh, again, uh, uh, Dr. Rex Cruz also part of this work, uh, and that is uh, helping our ministry or Department of Environment and Natural Resources and helping them in uh, looking at the top 10 priority programs of the ministry or the department, and then looking at how uh, they need to adjust these programs, what are the indicators, uh, what, what is the responsiveness of these programs to climate change, 1.5 degrees, and of course higher. And uh, this is with some funding from UNDP. And we were able to work with, uh, with the senior uh, officials of the ministry and able to, with them, uh, to come up with potential indicators and uh, potential impacts of climate change to the top 10 priority programs uh, of our uh, Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources. And then, so the other thing we're doing, uh, now this time more on the calm side, we believe that we have the science and uh, you know, part of our challenge is how do we communicate science to various stakeholders? And of course, one of those is the private sector and uh, being funded by the private sector. So we, we've been really uh, fortunate to be able with the top leaders of uh, businesses uh, uh, here in the Philippines. And we invited uh, you know, several speakers. Actually, every year we invite uh, people from outside the Philippines. Uh, for example, we invite, uh, invited uh, uh, Steve Wilson and, and others. We call this the legacy lectures and as well as the climate dialogues, inviting CEOs and, and uh, senior leaders of business and uh, trying to inform them of uh, how the climate is changing and how this could affect their businesses and therefore how they can respond uh, to climate uh, change. And then uh, we are also working with the Climate Change Commission this time in the budget tagging. You know that our country, like other countries of the world, are trying to budget tag or identify which uh, components of the national budget is uh, being uh, allocated for climate uh, change. Uh, so there's been this, uh, it's been going on for a few years, but uh, you know, we realize what's really the basis of this budget tagging? What's the basis of prioritization? Uh, is there a sound basis for say allocating X amount of money uh, for this particular intervention? And so we feel there's a need to make it more gr uh, science uh, grounded. And, and therefore we're trying to work with our, uh, uh, like a ministry, the Climate Change Commission, and trying to inject more science into the budget tagging. And uh, we're also working on what we call Project Upturn. And Upturn, Upturn is, is a project where we, where we try to identify the, 
uh, existing and, and potential solutions to uh, adaptation, climate adaptation. And uh, we're trying to, again, systematize how we uh, analyze and how we uh, look at all of these uh, adaptation, potential adaptation solutions to our country. And uh, as well, we're also working with uh, also the Climate Change Commission and even the Earth Observatory of Singapore. And uh, we're trying to uh, do a sea level rise study, SLR study. And uh, this is working with the CCC and hopefully the MPTE, uh, the technical panel uh, where we are also part. Uh, and uh, so we want to look at uh, sea level rise. In fact, we will have a webinar uh, coming up uh, in a couple of days, I think on Wednesday, uh, we will have this uh, webinar and uh, because we want to have, for example, uh, an atlas or maps and of course uh, derivative products uh, from this uh, sea level rise uh, mapping so that we can better help our country uh, prepare for uh, the rise of uh, sea level. And uh, again, talk about communication. We even produced a docufilm last year. It's called the Cuento ng Clima in Tagalog or in Filipino. In English, it means uh, stories, climate stories. And we produced this with ABS-CBN. We had a premiere and it's now available freely in YouTube. It's available in, in, you know, freely in, in the platform, uh, I want platform. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we uh, were fortunate or we were really happy uh, that we won this uh, silver, silver screen award uh, by the US International Film and Video Festival for a docufilm on environment and ecology. And again, this is part of the, our effort. Uh, there were many scientists and, and the good thing for me, the, what really attracted me was that this film combined scientists. There were scientists speaking, but there were lay persons, ordinary people, fisher folks, farmers, uh, and, and just uh, people from, from uh, Luzon and Visayas, Mindanao, three parts of the country, all uh, speaking about their experience on, on climate extremes and climate uh, changes that's happening around them. And, and that's why, you know, I, I think this is really uh, one of a kind uh, here in this country, uh, melding both science or scientists and uh, ordinary people talking about uh, their climate stories. And right now we also are, have launched uh, another effort uh, building on that, uh, on, on, on the docufilm last year. And this is the Climate Film Festival for the Youth. Again, with the Climate Change Commission, uh, we're working with them and uh, we have launched this a few weeks ago. Right now it's ongoing and we are challenging youths around the Philippines, especially because of the quarantine, because of the pandemic, they cannot go out. So we're challenging, challenging them to produce short films. And uh, so this will go on up to November this year. And uh, I guess uh, that's, uh, that's all for me. I want to say more, but time is so limited. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for listening. Back to you, uh, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lasco. That was a very excellent presentation, highlighting what an NGO can actually do in terms of not only advancing science, but also communicating science. And I think this is a great challenge uh, to reach different sectors of the society, not only the scientists, but even the youth and the rest of the public. 